All right, good morning. Welcome to Bagels and Business uh, for November. Um, and great topic today, uh, raising capital during the pandemic. And I'm just going to get right into it. you got a lot of cool things to say. So I'm going to introduce Andy Jorgensen here from Salt Lake Angels. And I'm just going to turn time over to you because i got a ton of questions and we've been chatting and I think we've just All right. got to get going. So let's get rolling. I don't know if I'm in the right position here. Thanks for joining me this morning, all of you. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself first because I don't like to talk about myself and so I like to get it out of the way in a hurry. So uh, I am on the executive committee for the Salt Lake Angels. I've been kind of running it uh, solo for the last couple of years, but now I have a little bit of help, which is good. Um, I also have uh, Lighthouse Investments, which is uh, a, a basically technology centered, but there's more to it than that. And there's about 90 companies in that portfolio. A lot of them here in Utah. And I also work with some of the other incubators and uh, sort of starts. Let's call it the startup community. I float around the startup community fairly well here. Uh, I sit on the boards of about 10 different companies, all in the technology space except for one. And uh, I've been doing this for a really, really, really long time. Uh, and there's my contact info at the bottom. All right. Does anybody recognize this picture? No. This is a fairly famous photo from pre-Renaissance. I think I've seen it, but I don't remember why. It's called the Dance Macabre. All right. The Dance Macabre, because we have a theme today, is from the Black Death, also known as the Black Plague. Mm -hmm. And if you remember anything about it, it was called the Black Plague because people's fingers would turn black. That was one of the first signs that they knew people had it. And most pandemics usually last two to three years. This one lasted a little over four, depending on where you were in Europe. But it kind of started out around Italy and then moved north and then moved into Russia and kind of lasted about four years. Uh, it came in through Southeast Asia, through rats and fleas on rats, and ended up going to humans, and wiped out about half of the population of Europe. Pretty good track record compared to the current pandemic, which is saying we're, we're doing pretty well in comparison. Of uh, Two things kind of happened because of this. Um, the Vikings, who had been, you know, pursuing the oceans blue very, very willy-nilly, were so devastated by it that they stopped. So you can imagine what the world would look like differently if they kept going. And the other was the entire system of government in Europe was based on sort of a top-down approach of what's good for the Lord is good for the manor. Um, and all of a sudden, all that changed. Anybody want to take a guess how that changed? All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> Interactive group today. What happened afterwards? Well, the decks kind of got reshuffled. Everything was turned upside down. The biggest factor was when you lose half your population and you're in a system that is based on what's good for the Lord, it's good for the matter, suddenly the matter doesn't have any workers. So the workers who were left demanded higher wages and better working conditions. Sounding familiar as a theme for anybody in the room. Uh, resource scarcity. There was uh, not a lot of supplies in the supply chain. Things were getting backed up. Things were getting overloaded. It was rapid inflation. And like the, uh, the inequality within the whole society you know, these matters in the whole feudalistic society basically collapsed because the, the people at the top of the food chain were kind of addicted to having all this cheap labor and indentured servants and everything else, and all of a sudden those people weren't there anymore. So with that, the whole social order got turned upside down. It led to the rise of what they call the merchant class, right? 
So you, it wasn't the middle class per se, but the more educated, the more industrious members of society ended up starting to rise, corresponding with the, the fall of the people on the top. So the first social mobility. And then those people who are better educated and now had some economic sort of influence over their outcomes, let's call it, um, because they weren't just working for the head of the matter, they were working for themselves, led to huge increases in innovation. Productivity went through the roof. It had to because you're dealing with less people. And craftsmanship became a huge thing. So again, these people were working for themselves. They took pride in what they were doing instead of just slapping it together for somebody else. You can see where this is kind of going, right? Because it's almost getting mirrored again here today. The other big thing around innovation was around medicine, right? These people are just being devastated. So you start having your first uh, incursions into building sewer systems and uh, looking into causes of death, like dissecting people, right? The very precursors of doing surgery happened at this time. And with the sort of collapse of feudalism and the whole surf thing, you ended up with freedom of movement. Those workers who were very, very prized could suddenly leave the manor and go work somewhere else where somebody was willing to pay them higher wages or they had better living conditions or whatever. So the whole thing, you know, had this cascading effect to ripping down the walls of society and allowing them to be built back up again, sort of from the bottom middle up instead of the top down. And this led to our bottom color here, which is sort of the Renaissance, right? So over, this didn't all happen overnight, but over about 100 years, all this sort of taking place and transformed society. So where that leads us is to our current situation. And we haven't been in this, this isn't unique. I mean, we've had these situations, you know, every 10 years or so, they just haven't been as hard hitting as this. I mean, uh, 12 years ago, the swine flu rolled in, and when that rolled in, it was killing about 12% of the population, which is much higher than this current pandemic. The difference is we were able to contain it really, really quickly and lock it down so that it didn't become a widespread epidemic. It was just sort of localized and then kind of, you know. And they also learned how to treat it really well, really, really fast, so people weren't dying as, as quickly. But it leads us to this book, which is the best way to predict your own future is to create it for yourself. And if there's any lesson to be learned about what happened after the Black Plague is that society was empowered by lots and lots of people deciding that they could create their own future, their own destiny for themselves. And that's what transformed the society. So what does that mean for you guys who are out there looking to raise some capital right now? There's never a good time to raise capital. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be an economic collapse. There's always going to be a downturn. There's always going to be a pandemic. There's always going to be something, right? And just look at these companies, right? Bamboo and its structure started right as Lehman Brothers going down the toilet, right? That was the last like major downturn, right? And they had to weather through about two years of complete mess in order to get their businesses going. These other companies kind of came out of the tail end of the, what they called the Great Recession. I mean, technically in 2010, we're still in the middle of the Great Recession. And these companies, would anybody like to be an owner of any of these companies <laughs> on this list right now? Like, they would, they would not be here. They would be driving their, what was it, Ferrari or Corvette? So they'd be driving their Ferrari around. Uh, I but all these companies started in times of like severe uncertainty. What's another thing that's unique about these companies? They're technology companies? Well, sort of. All of them sought to disrupt the existing order. Every single one of these companies was changing what 
the incumbents before them had done or the way that they were doing things. They were literally reshuffling the decks, upsetting the apple cart. Bamboo changed the way people do HR. Before it was like whoever your payroll provider was, was also your HR provider and they didn't do a very good job of it, right? They came in and changed it. Instructure came in, changed learning, right? Used to be, used to be your teacher was up here at the front of the room and they'd sit there and tell you all, all the lessons you learned on the whiteboard or the chalkboard. Instructor came in and said, hey, I think there's gonna be some computers in the classroom in a couple of years. I mean, in, in 2008, do you think that was kind of like a stretch to say maybe there'll be computers and tablets in the classroom? But yeah, that was their thesis. And you know, a couple billion dollars later, we're here. Every single one of these companies came up with a way to transform or disrupt the business that the incumbents were in. Lendio is a great example of just transforming lending. Think about it. After 2009, the banks weren't lending to small business anymore, right? You couldn't just walk into a bank and get a loan for your business. That just didn't exist. Here you go. Step right in, a billion dollars later, we've got a very, very nice, robust exit where a lot of happy people are driving their cars. All right, so what does it mean for us now? Right, we're right in the middle of a pandemic. You know, if I'm if I'm sitting there trying to raise some capital for my business, what's the environment that I'm sort of living in? Well, it's actually a remarkably good one. And the reason is, last year, people like me <laughs> got our wallets fattened significantly. And it's because, like, across the board, all these companies that have been hanging out there for anywhere from 10 to 15 years, you had huge multi billion dollar exits. Now, at the end of the day, you know, some, some of these companies were just massively financed. And they weren't necessarily, you know, the average Utah didn't have any sort of stake in them. Some of the average Utah didn't even know about it. Maybe you're driving down I-15, you see 1-800 contacts on the side of the road, or you see the Finicity building up by Midvale or, or Murray. You know, maybe past their buildings, but you had no idea what these companies did, right? Did anybody know what Galileo did? Debit cards. If you think about 15 years ago, you had credit cards, but you didn't really have debit cards. Well, that's another company that just capitalized on the move from credit cards to debit cards. There's probably 30 other companies that exited last year that you've never even heard of. You probably maybe drove past Point of the Mountain, looked at one of the logos on the building, and said, I wonder what the company does. Right? But what does $30 billion mean to the average Utah? <laughs> it means it, it means almost nothing. It works out to something like less than ten thousand dollars per person. So if you took all the money from all the exits and gave everybody a Utah dividend, it would be less than ten grand, right? But there's still a bunch of people driving around with their Ferraris. All right, what does it mean for you? Well, as I was mentioning to John. People in Utah tend to stay in Utah. In other places, like if you're in California and you have a big exit, you're like, I'm going to Mexico, I'm building a big mansion, I'm going to lay on the beach. Utah is different. People stay here because they want to be near their families, they want to be near the university that they went to, they want to be near their community, right? That's different from New York or Boston or Washington or, or the Bay Area. It's just a different mentality. So the people here stay here, and after they upgrade their house to a big mansion and they buy their Ferrari and they, you know, pay for their kids' college funds and everything else, and they're looking at that pile of money left over, they want to give back because they don't know necessarily what to do with it. Now, this is great if you're an entrepreneur because there's a lot of cash floating around there looking for places to invest, looking for opportunities. However, another thing about Utah people is they tend to be a little bit more conservative, not in the political sense, just a little bit more shy with their money, okay? 
So you have to keep that in mind that risk is a factor that they're, they're taking into account when they deal with an entrepreneur or an investment. The nice thing about this is what's called the flywheel effect. Does anybody know what the flywheel effect is? Inertia? Oh, man. It's kind of like when somebody goes to work for a startup and they're in there and it's like they're, they're jazzed to be working there. It's exciting. Every day is different. Like they're just pumped, right? Because it's not like a job that you just go to and it's boring and it's like the same thing every day. With these guys, they go to a job and they're just stoked. They're not set into necessarily a single role or duty they have to do. A lot of startup uh, people end up doing lots of different things. And that's exciting for them. They become jack of all trades. They like, they, you know, one day you're doing marketing, the next day you're doing sales, the next day you're doing delivery, the next day you're doing, you know, you're the janitor, you're emptying the waste baskets. But what it creates are these startup hyper employees, these people who are sort of addicted to the game versus somebody who's, you know, working in, you know, uh, I've been the accountant at this company for the last 30 years and this is all I do. You've got people who are just like pumped to be part of the next startup. You know, you don't, it, the difference between Qualtrics and Podium is like, you know, Podium is Qualtrics with text messages, right? And it's just like, you, you take all the employees, hey, we did it here once, we sold it to SAP for $19 billion. Let's go up the road two miles and do it again. And that's what the startup hyper employees look like, right? They're, they're ready to work and they're ready to go, you know, bang, and bang another win out, right? Now, the other thing I was talking to John about earlier was that this isn't just tech. It's across the board. Like this sort of Utah miracle that's happening is happening to companies of all sizes, of all stages, of all stripes. It doesn't just have to be the tech sector. We focus on the tech sector because that's the most scale, right? At the end of the day, we look for scalability as one of those criteria for investment. And guess what? Once you write the software, you can print it as many times as you want. And so the, the, the silicon slopes tends to get more of the attention because of that, because the exits are bigger, because of the scalability and everything else. But it's not just that. If your business is something other than tech, there's still room and opportunity for you as well. All right. So, has anybody ever heard of the five T's? Technology, team, traction. What they are? Uh, they are. Tell me what they are. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of them before me showing you on the screen? No. Okay. So the first thing is making your company attractive to investors. And um, about, I want to say, seven or eight years ago, um, the, the guy who's running Purple talked about um, you know, what it makes to make yourself an attractive company. Have everybody heard of Purple Mattresses? Mm -hmm. Not a tech co technology company, right? But still a resounding Utah success when it comes to business. And they've been playing with those little purple things for years. And then 2015, boom, it just went through the roof. Um, so the five T's kind of comes out of how to make your company attractive to investors, to make it, you know, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Checks all the boxes, right? You want your company to check all the boxes to, in the investor's mind, take some of that risk, right? I mentioned they're conservative. You want to take some of that risk off the table for them so that they feel comfortable with you, they feel comfortable with what you're doing, feel comfortable with their investment. So um, the five T's. First, have you ever heard the expression bet the jockey, not the horse? Yes. Okay. Team is very, very important to investors. We, we don't want to see, hey, you know, write me a check for $250,000 and I'm going to hire my brother, my wife, and my son 
to run this company and I'm going to pay them each, you know, $250,000 a year. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for well-formed teams. It doesn't have to be fully fleshed out like every box on your chart covered, but we want like a good, strong founder and co-founder and we want them to kind of complement each other's deficiencies. Like one could be good at technology, the other could be good at sales, or one could be good at manufacturing, the other one could be good at um, uh, partnerships and, and distributions, right? We want people who kind of complement each other's strengths and weaknesses, right? In addition to that, if you do, everybody has blind spots. Everybody in this room has something you're good at and they have something they're not good at, and usually, the things you're not good at are the things that you dread doing and you procrastinate and you put them off until the last possible minute because you don't like doing them. Very often, there's somebody else in this world who likes doing that thing that you don't like to do. Well, that's a good person to have as a partner, right? But when it comes to you, know, you and your team, then you don't know what you don't know. And that's where that board of advisors comes in. The advisors are very, very important to the equation because they're basically old, old guys like me or old ladies. There's, there's plenty of uh, people here who, who come up on um, the, 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 the other side of the gender fence um, in Utah, which is great about Utah because Utah has what I think the lowest income inequality in the country, something like that. Some, some crazy statistic like that. But there's an equal number of men and women out there who can be on your boards and serve as mentors, right? The next thing, the next T is technology. It doesn't necessarily mean software. It doesn't necessarily mean hardware. It doesn't necessarily mean tech. It means what is your sort of competitive advantage? There is really no business out there that you guys could do right now that won't involve technology in some way, right? And using it to your advantage to create a moat or a differentiator or some sort of advantage for your company. Maybe you're selling purple mattresses, but at the end of the day, you're selling them online, right? In e-commerce and delivering them to the person's door instead of putting them at, you know, mattress barn or it's the mattress warehouse, whatever the chains are. You know, you're selling them direct to the customer like uh, Purple did or Casper or one of those others, right? Just deliver right to your door. That is an example of a technological advantage because they don't have to have a big warehouse full of inventory. They can manufacture just in time. They can just send it to the person's house when it's ready, and you're off to the races. So that's an example of a competitive advantage. The next T is traction, right? And this shouldn't be underestimated. They want to know what you've been able to do on your own so far. What have I been able to accomplish? You know, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be huge. You know, there's there there's some examples here like Plural Site, you know, toiled away to become a ten million dollar company before they raised like any additional capital. Right? And all of a sudden, plural sites like an overnight success. Yeah, well, that's not an overnight success. You've been, you've been breaking your back for 10 straight years, right? And it's like finally somebody recognizes all this hard work you put into it and wants to write a check. But traction is very, very important to be able to communicate what you've been able to do with what you've had so far, right? Because it sets the stage for what you're going to do once you receive capital. What, you know, what am I going to do with the money is often predicated with what have you done without it. All right. The total addressable market. You're going to hear a couple terms. If you're going out there raising money, you're going to hear Sam, Sam, Tam, Tom, right? They're all about the market size, right? The M is always for the market. The, the total addressable market is how big the sector that you're selling it to. Right? So, you know, 1-800-CONTACTS is everybody who wears contact lenses, you know, in the world versus, um, I'm trying to think of another good example, like Domo would just be limited to, you know, businesses between 50 and 1,000 employees, right? And this is 
this is who we're going after. So think of total addressable market as how, how big in terms of customers there are times how much we can get out of each one of those customers, right? In, in terms of dollars and cents. Last but not least, the terms. That is the structure of the deal. Now, very often terms can be fluid. You can ask, right, for a certain amount of money. I'm going to give you 10% of my company for X. Shark Tank is the worst thing that has ever happened to <laughs> entrepreneurship because you have, a, it's co completely unreal, right? Oh, you have this guy sitting in the front of the room going, oh, I'll give you $50,000 for 50% of your company. And this guy's got a million dollar business and he gives it up, right? It's like, what are you doing? That's not necessarily reality. It's, 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 it's an over-dramatized you know, sense of reality. And what these, got, what these people are giving up is sort of access. I want, I want Mark Cuban on my board because it's going to make a difference in my business. But at the end of the day, the terms that you get with your investors are going to be a lot more favorable to you, a lot more entrepreneur friendly. Um, but you know, it's it's got to be negotiated, right? And you can set up a certain framework. You know, if you give me a million dollars, you're going to get 10% of the company, and all that stuff is going to be on the table in the beginning. But the terms have to be good for you, and they also have to be good for the investors. Right? So it's like everything else in life, it's a negotiation. In addition, on top of all that, the first five T's are really about your sort of company itself. These last three are really about you as CEO. So one of the most important things is coachability. There are a lot of people out there who have their vision of how they're going to transform the world, right? We talked about Lendio, we talked about instruction, we talked about Domo, 1-800-CONTACTS, right? So they all started out with a vision, right? And, and it's probably pretty dogmatic. I'm going to transform this industry. But coachability is equal important. Somebody who is dogmatic and set in their ways and this is the way I'm going to approach, usually is going to fail. We look for people who are pragmatic, people who can roll with the punches, people who can iterate on their concepts, on what works and what doesn't, right? Because when you're doing a startup, there's tons of iteration. You're always gonna be sitting there trying different things, seeing what sticks to the wall, seeing what people respond to. It could be marketing messages, it could be pricing, it could be your product iteration. It could be tons of different things. But as a CEO, you need to be able to just pull multiple levers at the same time and see what works. If you're a dogmatic, set-in-your-ways person who's not going to change things, then you're going to end up, sooner or later, you're going to run against a wall. Right? So coachability is very, very important. Because it goes back to those advisors. They're going to tell you, based on their experience, to try different things. Hey, I did this 10 years ago. It worked for me. Go try it. Right? Next thing, honesty. Ten years ago, Utah was the investment fraud capital of the world. <laughs> so you have a lot of investors who are absolutely petrified to write a check because of that. Now, things have gotten much better in the last ten years, right? There's a little more transparency going on. There's a little bit more honesty going on. And there's been some successful exits. So... If I, you know, if I get a million dollar check over here, I'm probably willing to forget the ten thousand dollar check that I wrote here where I got ripped off, <laughs> right? So, you know, good outcomes suddenly make the bad outcomes seem a little bit more erasable. But if there's something not right about your presentation, if there's something smells fishy to investors, they will run and they will tell other investors. I talk to Park City Angels at least once a month. I talk to the guys at UA2. I talk to the people at Venture Capital Library. If something smells wrong, everybody knows about it in less than a week's time. It goes really, really fast. The flip side of that is equally important. If you've got something good and you're generating buzz around it and everybody you know, loves you and trusts you and thinks you're a great entrepreneur, the opposite effect. You start, you know, 
you start gathering some speed and you start gathering some credibility and all of a sudden the herd mentality kicks in and everybody wants to write you a check, right? So honesty is the best policy and it's really the best way to approach any situation. Last but not least, very often, let's say I'm an entrepreneur, I think I need to raise $500,000 to get this idea off the ground and it's going to last me for the next year, right? Let's say that's that's my, my thesis for raising. If in less than a year you burn through that $500,000 and you want to keep the, the project going, you're probably going to need what's known as a bridge rate or something, you know, some sort of continued financing to keep your company going, right? The people who are most successful in raising those bridge rates to getting that next check before they get to sort of a, a larger financing round are the people who are very, very accountable for their actions. So it's not just being honest on the front end, but it's also being honest on the back end and doing what you say that you're going to do. That is pound for pound, I will tell you that the people who come back with their hat in their hand saying, I ran out of money, I just needed another 250K to get me through the next six months, can you please write me a check? Those guys, who have been accountable are the guys who get those checks. The guys who I said before, like, yeah, I hired my brother and I hired my wife and I hired my cousin and I paid them each hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, they don't get that extra check. They never do. <clears throat> All right. So where do you go? Anybody know? Go right here. <laughs> Give me the list. All right. So. For early seed stage stuff, right? I want to get my idea off the ground. I've got a little bit of traction. I want to move my business forward. Um, I mentioned it before. Salt Lake Angels, Park City Angels, and Utah County, it's UA2. Um, angel groups are sort of a weird animal, right? It's a bunch of people who get in a room that they see a bunch of deals, just like Shark Tank, and some people raise their hands, some people say no, and then you have these sort of shifting groups of investors, right? So, you know, for maybe I'll invest in tech companies, but I won't invest in healthcare. Or maybe I'll invest in consumer products, but I won't invest in, uh, who knows. Um, but at the end of the day, you get 60 people in a room and their interests are going to be different, their comfort level is going to be different, their check sizes are going to be different. You're working, the room, and hopefully you can get 10, 12 people to all agree to invest in you. Most of the angel groups are gonna work that way. Um, there are uh, uh, bigger syndicates, like some of the angel groups are starting to go beyond Utah borders and cross into Idaho or, or cross into Colorado or down into Texas or Arizona. Um, there used to be a little bit of a Vegas tech scene, but it's kind of Kind of got weird down there, so um, I don't know if it's as, as Pershing was. And then there's always California, right? So the the angel groups, like yes, they're here locally. You can stand up in front of them and talk to them, but a lot of them have graduated to doing things on Zoom meeting and syndicating beyond Utah borders. So just think of it that way. And then if you're a little bit further down the pipe and you've got some traction and things are kind of going. There's these venture groups that have kind of uh, set themselves up for like that early stage check. These are checks that are somewhere between 50, 100, 250, something in that range. So Beehive, Kickstart, Album, Peterson are all writing checks. You probably, of those four, Kickstart's the one you've probably heard the most about because they've been around the longest, they're on their third or fourth month, right? What, what is different about these venture seed things is they don't necessarily, they raise a fund, they deploy their investments, and then they repatriate those into their investment community, right? They don't re, they don't take the proceeds and reinvest like a mutual fund will, like when you guys are investing, right? So they, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is the timing, right? If you read the paper that Kickstart has just raised 
you know, fund four, and they raised $150 million, then you know that there's money in the wallet to go after. But if if kick starts at the end of round three and they've just got like a million dollars left in the bank, then you know there's more competition for that final money. So one of the ways to play this sort of angle is to find out when these people are raising, when that money's in the bank, and when their coffers are full. Okay, so uh, a good a good uh, place to often see this is either um, pitch book or um, crunch base. We'll both have like databases. I think PitchBook you have to pay for, but Crunchbase I think is free, and you can see the status of what what their funding levels are. All right, how am I doing on time? Okay. All right. So, what's the most important thing? Don't go in unprepared. If you don't have your pitch dialed in. And you go in front of an angel group, like I said, word spreads really fast. If you go in and fail in front of Park City Angels, we're going to know that your presentation was a disaster the next day, right? If you go in and, and you know kick butt and take names, we're going to know that as well. But if you go in and prepare, the chances of failure are higher, right? So there's tons, tons of resources here in Utah for you to take advantage of. Part of that is that giving back that we talked about before. When, when entrepreneurs have successful exits, they they kind of want to spread them around, right? Um, so one of them is right here, right here at the mill, and then uh, Goldman Sachs, ten thousand small businesses runs down second floor. Second floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then also is the SBIR still here? SBDC? No, no, they, uh, SBIR moved to the the. the State building up on Main Street. Okay, we still have access to it. Yeah. Okay. So the SBIR, if you're, if any of your funding um, relies on grants from the government or anything like that, the SBIR is also a useful place. It used to be here, I think, on the second floor. Mm -hmm. Another place mm -hmm. where you can go and pitch and practice in sort of a, let's call it a safe space, um, but it's not really a safe space, <laughs> is one million cups, right? So. One million cups allows you to get up in front of a bunch of people drinking coffee and pitch your business. And it's a helpful way to go in and rehearse sort of, you know, how you distill those five T's out to the rest of the world, right? And get your narrative kind of dialed in. Um, and, and when you say not a safe space, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's other yeah. entrepreneurs. So they can be critical of each other. Okay. So it's, you know, it's not like you're going to get tomatoes and eggs thrown at you, but right. you know they're they're going to be critical because they're going through it themselves. So is that kind of like uh, Simon Cowell on The Voice or something like that? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, it's not that. Yeah, it's not that bad. I mean, I think it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it, they try. It's, it's, it's you're not going to get a pat on the back out of boy, right? You're going to get constructive criticism, which is really good, actually. Hopefully. Yeah. If some people, if you're afraid of public speaking, which I am, yes. right, <laughs> then, then you know that could be daunting, right? Yeah. Getting up in front of people. I'm I'm the worst at public speaking. I just get up here and ramble. Um, all right, so one million cups again. It's it, pitch practice, right? Just think of it that way. Uh, VentureCapital.org. I would say um, that the program is very good. What VentureCap.org does is for about four to six weeks, they put you into an environment where you have anywhere from six to eight mentors who will work with you on your pitch and nothing else but that, right? They will, you know, hammer it home, uh, sometimes with different results, right? Sometimes the results are great, sometimes they're not. Their track record is phenomenal. Something like 70% of the companies that go through that program as free get funded, but you have to get in, right? One of the reasons they're able to deliver a 70% is there's a gatekeeper in front deciding whether or not you get in, right? So they're kind of, they're not taking everybody. If they're taking everybody and getting 7% success rate, right? it would be different than if you're screening people, right? Um, but great program, great mentors. Um, and then at the end of the program, you get uh, what's known as a deal form where you get to present in front of a bunch of investors across the community. And I think they're doing it too. 
Um, and then so, you know, that's where you can really get access to venture capitalists, angel investors, so on and so forth, right? Same thing with um, uh, Assure. Assure purchased Boom Startup. It kind of went dormant for a number of years. Uh, Tara Spaulding has taken over. She is running um, a, a program through there that is covering multiple facets of uh, raising capital. Um, they do um, pitch contests and startup contests. So you can win yourself a little money if you enter these contests. There's usually anywhere from 36 to 50 companies in it. And then, you know, there's probably four categories at the top of them. If you win your category, you get some money. So right, kind of cool. Uh, Investable is here. Um, I don't believe they are free. I think they do charge a little bit of um, equity to go through the program. I haven't, I haven't talked to them in a while, uh, so I'm not sure if they're still how they're still doing that. But they also have a very good track record of getting people capital raised. I would say Investable is probably for somebody who's a little bit more advanced, a little bit more later stage in their development. And the same thing with Rev Road. Rev Road is down in Utah County. They have a great facility, great resources. Their model is a little bit different. They bring people into their space, and then you're working in their space, and they're uh, coaching you every day. But I've invested in probably six or seven companies that have come out of Rev Road. And they're usually very, very well curated, but they're also very good. By the time they get out of there, they're really aligned for success. They're, they're on the road. Um, and then there's, as you probably know, there's just a ton of incubation spaces that are out there that you can go and work. Now, a lot of those spaces um, are seeing diminished uh, <laughs> attendance, for lack, for lack of a better term. Um, but, you know, you know, some of them are like Kiln and um, WeWork and that, that kind of environment. They're good because you're able to be in a place with other entrepreneurs and things are kind of buzzing and hopping and it's a, it's a good ecosystem. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's office space, right? It's not, it's not people mentoring you. It's not necessarily people working with you. Those environments are great because of the buzz, because of the activity, because of the idea sharing. But they are also what you make of it, right? Some of these other things are people kind of pushing you and stewarding you along versus an incubation space is kind of for really self-help people who kind of um, know what they're doing. So let's talk about strategies. And, that, and I'm coming to the end. And I'll put out the question. So used to be raising about 12 months worth of runway. I have been telling everybody that um, while money is plentiful right now and people are pretty flush, it is taking a longer time to raise that money. So try to raise about 18 months worth of cash for you to go through and then budget accordingly because again, while if you're a good entrepreneur, that fridge round is easy to come by, it's also something you don't want to do, right? Because it can, it can then, depending on your deal structure, it can dilute you, you're giving up extra equity early on in the process that if you were more economical with your cash, you could give up that equity later at a higher price and a higher valuation. Right? So plan for about 18 months. Um, not to subject everybody to buzzword bingo, but know your metrics. Right? People are going to ask you how much is how much you pay to acquire a customer. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, what's your CAC? And if you don't know what your CAC, they're going to call you out on it. Right? Lifetime value, right? Same thing. You know, it cost me fifty dollars to acquire a customer. I can extract two hundred and fifty dollars out of that customer over their life of me being a customer, that's the metrics of my business, right? Um, ARR and MRR is like everybody and their mother is addicted to the subscription model. You like, you, you know, everybody thought razors was kind of like, you know, fun and unique, but doggy chew toys, like, you know, arrived at your door every month to get your doggy chew toy every month. Everything now is under a subscription model. You can find a way to 
get your customer and keep them paying you over time, right? That is a beautiful business model. And so they're going to ask you what's your ARR and your MRR. All right. When we started this conversation, we talked about labor and what's happening post pandemic, right? All of a sudden, you know, labor is hard to come by. Everybody is struggling. And it does, it's not just the restaurants, it's the call centers, it's the technology companies. Everybody's struggling to find the, the people who will do the job that they want to do across the board. Utah's at what, 2.8% unemployment? That's, that's called negative employment at that point. So, one of the things that you can do is make the staff that you have go further. So, plan to invest in technology, automation, anything you can do to make it so that those people that you do hire go a little bit further, right? All right. The next thing is it's easy to um, put out the big blueprint to scale like crazy. You know, we're gonna we're gonna raise five hundred thousand, then we're gonna raise one point five million, then we're gonna raise five million, and everything's gonna go, you know, swimmingly across across this great financing round, and we're gonna go to the stratosphere. But when you plan, plan to plan the path that gets you to cash flow positive quickest. You never know when this capital is going to dry up. You never know when the next 1929 is going to happen. So if you have a business that if you receive no more additional capital ever and you're still cash flow positive, you can keep that business going. If you're building a business that's just addicted to the next raise, the next raise, the next raise, and it's never profitable, right? Which happens during boom times, right? You, I mean, if you remember Amazon, right? Amazon said we're not going to make money for 20 years, right? We're just going to keep pumping capital in and never make any money. Well, yeah, for 20 years they lost money. Now they now they're making money, but you know it was just an endless supply of investors going like, well, you, I, I have to write another check here, and another check here, and another check here. Same thing's going on with Tesla, right? Tesla is just raking in the money and, you know, they're not making, they're not showing any profits here. They're just deploying capital. But for you, you know, you're not Elon Musk. <laughs> you're not, you, you've got to look for how to get to positive cash flow as quickly as you can. And then you can play from there. Getting to positive cash flow will make you a more attractive company for investors, right? Because it's like, they don't feel like they're signing up for the endless check chain. All right. Um, the next thing is, your once you raise your first round, look for pathways to your next round. Sometimes that means your investors make introductions to other investors. Sometimes it means they make introductions into some of these seed funds. Sometimes these financing rounds can come from your customers or potential customers. So very often we see that, like, at some point somebody will take a significant interest in your business while you're selling to them as a prospect and then they'll say hey i'd like to invest in this and they'll they'll end up writing a check too so always kind of be looking for where that next round is going to come from after you raise your first one right the nice thing about it is if you do it right this person could be your potential acquirer Right? It very, very often we see somebody that is selling to a customer and you know they try it, they like it, and the next thing you know, that customer is buying it you know, as, as part of their money. Last and most importantly, be careful who you take money. I can't say this enough. Uh, you know, we kind of talked earlier about the investor fraud. There are vulture capitalists here, and they will take your company, right? They will, you know, get you to a point where you've got something successful and they will, they will take it from you. So you have to look at the reputation of the person that you're taking money from. You don't have to worry about that much with the, like, the seed funds and stuff like that, but if you're taking money from an individual, you know, ask them, you know, who you have invested in before. Can I talk to them? You know, what was the outcome of that investment, right? And if if somebody is, you know, writing checks and every single check that they wrote resulted in a lawsuit <laughs> three to five years later, 
then run from that person because that's not a person you want to be taking money from because they'll either tie you up in court for years of your life or they'll take your company from you and you don't want either one of those things to happen to you within your company. All right. Now, I promise I don't bite. More or less. Ask me questions. All right. I got to follow up on what we were talking about earlier. If you go back one slide. Yep. The very thing, plan to raise at least 18 months worth of runway. Mm -hmm. Is that a single raise or was that multiple raise or what? How? how That's kind of your, that your first trip to the tank, right? Your first trip to the gas station. Don't. Uh, don't, a lot of people will tell you it's 12 months. Try to raise for 18 just because you never know, right? It's better to just have a little bit more just in case. Right now, it's a really entrepreneur friendly environment to raise capital. But four years ago, it wasn't. 2017, 2018, like, were really, really tough for entrepreneurs here to raise money, right? But then, you know, the pendulum swung the other way. But you know, you don't know how fast that pendulum is going to swing. And you don't know like you know which direction it's going. And it's becoming more entrepreneur friendly or less. So by having a little extra cushion, you're just protecting yourself there. And for investors, it's not going to seem like an unreasonable request to go from 12 months to 18 months. It's it's not a big deal. Do you have uh, good resources to calculate your customer acquisition costs? Because it seems like a, to me, it seems like a very complicated way to do it. It is. Um, it depends on the business, right? If if my if I'm running an e-commerce business, I can get that data right out of Google Analytics and look at my ads and stuff like that, right? Those things become easy to calculate. If I'm running, you know, a bunch of dry cleaners. Right? Say I've got six or eight dry cleaners and they're all across the Wasatch Front and I'm putting you know, those postcards in the mailers that arrive at your door and maybe I'm running a billboard on I-15 every once in a while and maybe I've got like an ad in the newspaper. Customer acquisition cost becomes harder to calculate. And that's why you'll see lots of people have questions like, well, how did you find this? How did you learn about this? Right? They're trying to <clears throat> justify that spend. So it depends on your business. It's it's not always a precise science, but try to do your best in understanding how your customer found you and how much you spent to get them in the door. Right. So based on that, do you know any resources that give you a good comprehensive uh, I mean, guide or I how you do it? Yeah. I in the past have used just Excel okay. where I create what's what's known as a funnel. Right, and I and at, at the top of the funnel, let's say I run an ad on Google, and that ad's going to appear to 500,000 people. Right. And then of that 2%, we're going to click. And then of that 2% who click, you know, if I'm doing really well, 3% of those are going to buy something. And then I look at, okay, what's the average cart at the bottom of that, right? And it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be um, any sort of software you buy. It could just you could just write it down on a piece of paper. This is this is what I'm doing. But I would approach it from the top of the funnel all the way through their journey to making the sale and looking at looking at your spend on each one of those lines. HubSpot kind of has a you can use HubSpot to track customers and spend and all that too. But it's not super cheap. But the mill that will give you discount. HubSpot. 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 Yeah, HubSpot has a really good startup uh, program. You can start for free. Yeah, that'll let you do it. Yeah. And it gets you, it gets expensive over time. I mean, the company I'm working for now, they they were the first year they spent six thousand, the second year they spent eleven thousand. Yeah, year, that's a problem. Seventeen thousand. Yeah, <laughs> it's like so you probably want to transition. Get one to use it. Have money to use it, I guess. But yeah, they. I mean, that's that's why they're giving it away so cheap for the first years. Yeah. Once you're in there, it's hard to move. It 
Any questions online? I don't have any questions online. Anybody else? What is your chance? Yeah. What is the uh, application? Is there an application process? What does it look like if you wanted to pitch to selling angels? Ah, great question. So um, there is a platform out there called Gust, G-U-S-T. Gust is kind of like um, the worst. Um, <laughs> Hi, I hope somebody from Gust is watching. Like, how many people have I slammed? <laughs> like, you know, angry phone calls. Um, so, like, Gus is the platform that a lot of the angel groups across the world use, and what it allows you to do is have an application process, and it also lets you house what's known as your deal room, which is all your due diligence folders, like your presentation, your financials, all that stuff, in a secure location where only the investors can see it. So, Gus is really good for that. Um, however, Salt Lake Angels, we dumped Gus because we couldn't stand it. It was horrible. So for us, if you want to apply to Salt Lake Angels, you just go to slcangels.com. Click apply now. Um, but like I said, a lot of the different groups across the country use Gus. And it is convenient of not having to set up a Google Drive and put all your files there and share them. You could just put them on Gus and you can say, okay, I want this group to be able to see them or not. So it's handy for that. Um, uh, is it helpful to be like introduced? So if I'm working with Tara at Boom, which I am, like is it easier for me if I were to have an introduction made and then go apply that kind of thing? Warm intros, always the best, okay. right? For angels, it's good. For the VC space, the kickstarts of the world, it's great. <clears throat> A warm intro gets you miles ahead of knock on the door, right? That's, um, like, I, like I mentioned before, the community here is kind of small. We all kind of talk to each other. So that warm intro, you know, it, it's a form of credentialing for you. And so, like, if Tara likes you, then we like you too, right? <laughs> it's kind of that thing. Um, and the same thing, there's, there's, there's people who play in this place that have a high degree of respect, right? So Jeremy Lund over at the U, you know, if Jeremy says you're great, then I'm going to listen, right? If, if Ted McAleer over at Park City Angels says you're great, I'm, I'm going to listen. So there's, there's, there's all these people, you know, when there were events, we would see each other at these events and talk about, like, who's the latest and greatest startup, but since there's no events anymore, there's less of that going on, and a lot of it's kind of moved on. So we're just emailing each other and say, hey, I got a really good one you, you need to look at this. Yeah. How does someone take your company uh, if they are always kept in a minority position? Muscles. They, a lot of these guys, well, so let's talk about the entrepreneur's blind spot, right? So two of the biggest entrepreneur blind spots, entrepreneurs tend to know their product or their service and their customer and you know how to make those things talk to each other really, really well. But what they don't often know is finance, accounting, taxes, or legal, right? And us, on our side, that's all we're doing all day is legal and accounting and finance, right? So if you get somebody like me who's sort of a benevolent dictator, I'm gonna help you with that. <coughs> But if you get somebody who's got some malicious intent, they're going to take advantage of the fact that you don't know the legal and you don't know the financial, and they can just tie you up in court with lawsuits. They can just make your life in fine print. It's not just fine print. It's just like we live in a country where anybody can sue for anything at yeah. any time. And, and, you know, it's the, it's, it's, it's great, right? Because if you are legitimately hurt, then you have recourse. But it's not great in that, you know, if you're just making stuff up you and you have deep enough pockets, which investors generally have deep pockets, then the entrepreneurs that they're investing in, they can afford to pay lawyers. And that's the unfortunate side. 
And I don't say this to scare you. It's very, very rare, but it's it's happened probably three times in the last three years that in, in deals that I've been involved in. So that's not that un. I've got 90 companies in my portfolio and three. So yes, it's rare, but it sucks when it happens. Yeah. Um, if you have had somebody offer to kind of merge or t take you, take your company in to help it stay solvent, to help it, mm -hmm. if it's already been in business for a bit. Yep. Um, yet the coachability aspect, if you feel like that person is going to make you the minority or make you the, like change your, your, your message, change your product, change your service that you're offering. How do you balance that? Like here? You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so let's look at the possible scenario. So one is, you know, if they're that passionate about it, then just have them buy you up. You know, just, you can, you can buy a hundred percent of the company and I, I can continue, we can structure an agreement where I continue to work for you for like a year or two or something like that, just a transition. But if somebody is that passionate and dogmatic about this is the way that things need to be done, you don't want to be put in that minority position or have somebody running the company into the ground, right? Because I've been through it. I sold the company. I watched the person, you know, they, they said, we'll sign a contract with you for four years to stay on and you do it. And, and I couldn't even make it a year because I watched what they were doing. Just, you know, I went from 100 employees to three in 10 months. Oh, wow. So be careful, you know, <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, if they care that much about it, here, buy the 100%. Because you don't want to be, you know, they, the opposite is true. If, they, if they're right, you know, when they grow up to the moon, then you kind of missed out. But I, I wouldn't put myself in. If it's your baby, you don't want to have your baby. So <laughs> you, just, you just want to let them. Raise your kid and keep it. Yes, <laughs> give them up for adoption. <laughs> Sorry, I had a question. No problem. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the likely inflationary trend and uh, just the geopolitical climate and how that affects investors. I think that's, I guess, that's yeah. what the question is. But, yeah. I, I am A, not an economist, and B, not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> so I will answer as best I can. Um, I think uh, the supply chain constraints are uh, should not have not been unexpected. I started you out with the Black Plague, and the exact same thing happened there, right? Um, the the reality of, of the situation is when the you know China wasn't exactly as you know open about what was happening there. You know, I'm pretty sure more than 80,000 people were infected in Wuhan, right? So with that lack of transparency, we didn't know when the factories were being shut and what was happening over there, right? We didn't necessarily know. But when, you know, when they started to get hold of the situation on the ground and the factories started opening up, then all of a sudden we have this bottleneck, right? And it's going to take a while to un unwind that bottleneck. That's just simple economics that the only cure is time, right? For that supply chain difficulty. Don't try to get your PlayStation Five for, for this Christmas. <laughs> um, the the other side of the coin, which is really interesting, is China's infrastructure stuff, right? So, if if you're aware of what they are doing, they're re reimagining the Silk Road into Europe. Right? because they don't have to deal with the Pacific. So they're building these massive high-speed rail lines and roads and everything else to get from the manufacturing centers into the European and Eastern European corridors because that represents a market for them. Right? And they're bulldozing everything in their path to get here. Um, so while they definitely have some challenges with like the Himalayas and stuff like that, they're going to build that whether the other piece of the puzzle is what China's doing is Africa. If you haven't noticed, they've pretty much bought Africa. Like, <laughs> like they've entered in 
all these sort of relationships to make sure their supply chain, their resource chain, everything that comes out of Africa is in place. They've locked it all up. Right? So that's kind of both economic and geopolitical at the same time. As far as here in this country, I think the, the, the trends for the last 10 years have only favored the entrepreneur. It costs less to start a business now than it did 10 years ago, and it costs significantly less to start a business now than it did 20 years ago. I mean, when I started my career, you know, I was like, okay, I, I need a million dollars minimum to bring this product or service to market. And who's going to write this check for this 25-year-old kid who wants a million dollars, right? That, that A, that entrepreneurial ecosystem didn't even exist like that. You know, you're like, where do I go um, to get this money? But 10 years ago, that might have been $200,000 to get that same business idea off the ground. Now, today, that is maybe $50,000 to test an idea and bring it to market. Something, an insane number, 51% uh, of like the Dow companies have turned over in like my 10 year period. It used to be the Dow was like, you know, like, or, or the Fortune 500 was like, you know, the same company, same companies. In order to go like, you know, Apple is entering the Fortune 500. Oh my God, like all this fanfare. Like now, that is just turning over like almost monthly. Like something like, you know, 10 years ago, 50% of the companies weren't, weren't in that list. That's how fast the disruption in innovation is taking over the market. Like, just hammering away. Um, uh, trying to think of Zawara. Yeah. If anybody ever gets a chance to look at Zawara's pitch deck from 2016, they talk about this, like, and it's unbelievable. They 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 predicted the subscription economy. They disrupt. They predicted like mass industries would be disruptive. Who? Who thinks it's a great idea to invest in like taxi cab companies or rent car agents? <laughs> Self driving taxi cab. That's pretty capital intensive. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they, like, you know, you've got a situation where, you know, Airbnb is worth more than all the hotel chains combined. Uber is worth more than all the rental car companies combined. The rental car companies are like on their last legs. When the pandemic hit, they sold all their fleets just to keep the lights. They have no cars to rent. You know, it's it's complete overhaul. Um, any other questions? Sorry. No, that's good. We're grateful that we're UK. I tried to talk fast. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, you guys, uh, make sure you're um, on our newsletter. And you guys out on the on the cyber, go to our website, benmiel.sfcc.com, subscribe to our newsletter. We have more events like this coming up. And we're going to continue um, with what Andy talked about with the financial piece and um, understanding legal in some classes coming up in the next uh, couple of months. So stay tuned, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.